This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less taxes. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, founder and CEO of Wealth Ability. So we have had an eviction moratorium effectively for about a year and a half. Uh, the Supreme Court just uh, struck it down. Um, they've struck it down, <laughs> really struck it down twice. The first time Joe Biden says, well, we're going to keep going anyway. Um, uh, the second time, who knows? But now we know that New York is, is uh, you know, extending their eviction moratorium. And so I, I wanted to discuss this because I think it's such an important uh, matter about property rights and, uh, you know, what do landlords do? What does anybody who owns property do? Um, and so we invited uh, Ethan Blevins on today. Th thank you so much for coming, Ethan. Uh, Ethan is an expert in this area. He's, in, he's on the um, landlord side of several lawsuits. And uh, Ethan, just welcome to the Wealth Ability Show. Thanks so much for having me. So if you would, Ethan, just give us uh, a little bit of your background and uh, why this has become <laughs> kind of your issue. I see your your liberty or death, and I, I love that. So um, behind you, that's perfect for what we're talking about today. Sure. So I'm an attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation, and Pacific Legal Foundation is a public interest law firm. And we lit litigate a variety of constitutional issues around the country, primarily property rights. So we've been very involved in the various property rights issues and other individual rights issues that popped up during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, have been around since the 1970s and have litigated many times all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And so I am involved personally in property rights issues uh, and these moratoria, as well as the separation of powers and free speech are my other issue areas. Oh, interesting. So uh, let's get right into it. Let's talk about um, the Supreme Court decision, the most recent Supreme Court decision, um, where the Supreme Court decided against the government in, uh, this, and the CDC on the moratorium. What does that really mean, though? I mean, if, if uh, the President of the United States can say, well, we're just going to disregard this, what does that even mean that there's an eviction moratorium uh, that, that, that so-called so has ended? Well, I think it, on, a, on a broader level, it, it is a frightening sign, I think, for the rule of law in general, right? That the President of the United States basically just says to the United States Supreme Court, I know you've said that what I'm going to do is unlawful and I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. But uh, as for what this means for the specific issue, these eviction moratoria, it means only really that the agency, the CDC itself, can't adopt an eviction moratorium. It does not prevent Congress from going ahead and adopting the eviction moratorium, which they had done previously for a short period of time before the CDC stepped in and, and adopted its own. So while it does, it is a major victory for property rights and the rule of law that the CDC cannot just, you know, on its own initiative, basically become a lawmaker in its own right. Uh, it does not prevent Congress, the proper lawmaker, from adopting the moratorium. Now, there may be other reasons why Congress might not be able to do that under the United States Constitution. But as far as what the U.S. Supreme Court said, it said, you know, we don't think that the CDC has statutory authority to do this. Gotcha. So it's really limited to preventing the CDC from passing eviction moratorium. It doesn't prevent the states or Congress at this point from doing something like what the CDC has done. So, so, so let's take the state. So we, we just saw New York um, just extended its eviction moratorium. Um, is it allowed to do that? Will that go, you know, will that go to Supreme Court as well? I mean, are we going to start seeing these lawsuits um, from, I, I hope, from taxpayers, the taxpaying public um, that, that go to the higher courts um, because of this, Ill, what I, I deem to be an illegal taking of property? But uh, wh what are we going to see and what does this mean with regards to the states? So the, uh, as probably many of your listeners know, and as you allude to, a lot of the states have passed eviction moratoria starting around March 2020, many of, many, many of which are still in place. And of course, New York has recently extended. Washington's has gone on about 18 months now. And so uh, it's, it's a continuing problem despite the Supreme Court's ruling on the CDC eviction moratorium. Um, the 
The United States Supreme Court's ruling on the CDC eviction moratorium, though, did have kind of a sneaky line in there that I think was very intentional, which they said, hey, this eviction moratorium really uh, fundamentally deprives landlords of their right to exclude. And the, in doing so, the Supreme Court cited to an old uh, takings case. Now, the United States Constitution, among other things, prohibits the taking of property without just compensation. And a lot of these um, state level lawsuits have said, hey, when you tell a landlord they can't evict somebody, that's effect effectively appropriating their property and you owe them compensation for that. Well, so the Supreme Court kind of sneakily cited to a taking, an old takings case, um, and said, we think this is a violation of the right to exclude. What that seems to imply is that the United States Supreme Court, if it were to address whether or not these eviction moratoria are an unlawful taking, that they would say it is. Um, and uh, myself and many other property rights attorneys were quick to point this out um, in the ongoing state lawsuits against the eviction moratoria. To date, those lawsuits have fallen on deaf ears. Um, some of them are ongoing, so we don't know what will happen, but the courts have largely been very unsympathetic to the argument that this is an unlawful taking of landlord's property. But I hope that'll change. Under, under, under what theory? Under what theory is this not an unlawful taking of landlord's property? So what the government has said and so far has been successful is that landlords have already invited these tenants onto the property. And so they've kind of willingly given up their right to exclude the tenants uh, afterwards. Now, what we've said is, yeah, it's a limited right to enter the property, right? It's, on, it's based on conditions established in a lease agreement. And when those conditions are violated, the landlord has a statutory and constitutional right to end that relationship. Um, but the courts have accepted this idea that, hey, once you've invited them onto your property, your right to subsequently exclude them can be um, limited without causing a taking. So, so what is a landlord supposed to do? I mean, granted, you know, good landlords have been working with their tenants. I, I get that. And there are, you know, I think most tenants, you know, it's that they're not, you know, they're not just um, squatting, basically. But there are a number that clearly are. Um, they're simply squatting. Uh, so what does a landlord do in the situation? And, you know, we've seen reports in the Wall Street Journal and other places where landlords, uh, basically the Wall Street Journal reported one case where a landlord themselves were homeless because their sole source of income was the property. And they had two tenants. It was a duplex. They had two tenants in there, both of which uh, were not paying. And so they're out on the street and they, they're, they're homeless themselves. So what does a landlord do under this kind of scenario? Unfortunately, that's not the only story like that. And it's really unfortunate that uh, a lot of these individuals are small time landlords who can't uh, deal with months and months of no revenue. And there's very little that they can do. So, and what we typically do, as you mentioned, is you negotiate with your tenant and most landlords are glad to do that and they work out a deal. The problem is when you've told the tenant that there's really no consequences, for violating the terms of the lease, the tenant has, there's no bargaining power left. The tenant has no reason to negotiate with the landlord when there's really no consequence. I mean, what they can can do and, and should do is see if there are any um, grounds for eviction beyond non-payment of rent, right? So a lot of these eviction moratoria will say, you can't evict for non-payment, but it leaves open the option to evict for other lease violations. And so it may help to, you know, uh, exercise the right to enter the property and see if there are other lease violations going on. Otherwise, there's very little that a landlord can do ex except uh, petition the government and wait. So, so let's roll down the road here a little bit. And uh, the eviction, it, it will the eviction moratoriums ever be lifted? Um, are these going to be put into in place permanently? Will the the government require the rent to be forgiven? Um, or will there actually be evictions down the road? So we've already seen some laws come into place now that do kind of permanently ensconce some of what's going on. For example, the city of Seattle passed a moratorium back in March 2020. They recently just passed a law that says you can never evict based on non-payment of rent during this period of time, which means that once the moratorium is over, 
Um, even the even if somebody has you know spent the last eighteen months free writing, you can't evict them on that basis. So we're definitely seeing some efforts to uh, not only extend the moratoria but make some of this a little bit more permanent. Um, I've argued that really this is kind of um, a progressive a part of the progressives' wish list that they are essentially sneaking in as as moratorium relief. They've long uh, disliked um, eviction. They want they want to limit it or outright ban it, and so they're I think largely taking advantage of this as an opportunity to do that. Which is why these have extended on for so long, even after we have um, vaccines in place. Even long after I mean, now we have the Delta variant, of course, but long after we've dealt with this, um, it's clearly no longer an emergency measure. Right. So. Um... Let's say you're you're thinking of becoming a real estate investor. You're going, do you, I mean, I'm asking you personally, would you ever be a, a, an invest, uh, be a, a landlord in one of these states that is taking these harsh approaches? I mean, would, would you put your money up against the government? Uh, no. In fact, I, I have of, I've often wondered why landlords in these states and cities stick with it. Um, and a lot... It, Frankly, a lot of them have sold out or try to sell out, but they can't because sometimes these eviction moratoria bar that, maybe recognizing that landlords would just try to get out of the business. Um, and there's a lot of other things going on that prevent that. The city of Seattle has, for example, banned evictions just during any school year um, if, the kid, if there are kids of school age. And so a lot of these laws make it so unfriendly and impossible for a landlord to have any expectation um, regarding, uh, you know, the fair rate of return that uh, I would personally never invest in it. And a lot of landlords, are unfortunately, are leaving the business for that reason. Yeah. So, so you would have to think that eventually this will create a um, real shortage of uh, housing in those areas where they're preventing evictions. What, what do you think will happen there? I mean, if, 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 if you're saying landlords, you have no property rights, and basically you're saying landlords, we don't want you to build property. We don't want you to own property. So now what happens to all of those? Do they become government owned? Is, is this something that's gonna become part of, uh, is the state gonna take these over and make these um, basically homeless shelters? So the statistics I've seen have shown that during the course of the pandemic, about 20% of landlords have at least sold one, if not all, of their units. Uh, and that's a remarkably high number, especially in a relatively short period of time. It indicates that, you know, they no longer feel like they can trust the validity of their lease agreements, and I can't blame them. They, and they obviously rely on the ability to enforce that promise. Uh, to make their business model work, and they no longer can. Um, what I think that means, as you say, is a shortage of rental housing. The, I, I think the governments have said, well, it's just going to turn over and be, be purchased by somebody else. Um, the reality is, though, a lot of it's getting purchased and bought up by um, people who intend to, uh, to own. Um, we know it's a really hot housing market right now. Um, so a lot of what was pre previously rental housing is being gentrified into um, home, home, uh, home ownership. That means it's no longer going to be on the affordable rental housing market. Um, the city of Los Angeles, speaking to the idea of whether they're going to take this up as public housing, ex expressly, one of the city council members expressly said, well, we can always buy up properties that are going to go under um, and turn them into public housing, which I think is a pretty remarkable statement from a a government official. So I think some of that probably will happen. In any, in either case, a lot of it's just going to go off market into condos, luxury housing, sure. or just single family ownership. Right. So, so it's a, it, it really is a, it, it's going to cause a, a housing shortage really on the lower income side. So the people who they're so-called protecting right now could be the ones who pay the biggest price. Right. And this supply side economics is just something that never seems to enter into the picture here, right? The idea that, um, you know, landlords are going to respond to this regulation in some way. And if they leave the market, the, the government just doesn't seem to consider what, what the results of that are going to be. Um, I mean, the last thing we need coming out of the pandemic is a um, increase in uh, the need for affordable rental housing. <laughs> they're trying to prevent people from ending up on the street, but unfortunately at the end of the day, they're just creating a longer term crisis. So let's go to the bigger picture here, um, Ethan. Let's talk about property rights in general. We have, uh, and you can, you can explain it better than I can, a um, constitutional right to our property. 
um, which is different than a lot of countries. Um, so how do you think this, these uh, moratoria and, and specifically uh, President Biden's decision to ignore the law, basically, how do you think that impacts the future of property rights in the United States? I think it creates a, um, a lot of unpredictability. And your rights, I think especially economic rights, like property rights, rely a lot on predictability. Um, so when you're looking to becoming a landlord or purchasing property, can you look forward to the future and trust that um, what you can do with that property to today is going to be true in, in one, two years down the road? Um, or you know, is there a chance that you're going to purchase a property with a plan to subdivide it, but there's a risk that maybe the government's going to all of a sudden require some kind of um, new lot requirement that's going to prevent that subdivision. That happens all the time. So you buy a property um, with a certain plan and then the zoning changes, something else changes, and all of a sudden your plan uh, no longer exists. In those circumstances, a lot of people will claim, hey, this is an unlawful talk taking of my property rights. I bought it in 2017 with the right to you know, develop two lots on it. They rezoned it, so now I can only develop one. That means that's a taking of my property. Unfortunately, it's very hard to prove that. Often you have to prove such a high percentage of lost value um, that it's just, you know, you can show maybe 60% 60, 60 of my economic value has been lost because of a rezone or because of a new urban growth boundary, whatever it might be. And that's just not enough. Um, as far as what the president has done, I think it indicates that President Biden, at least, and maybe future administrations, will get away with what they can, right? He, he said, um, even after the Supreme Court really indicated quite obviously that what they thought he was doing was unlawful, he said, well, at least we can, um, you know, do this long enough to get the rental assistance out before court strikes it down. By the way, he turned out to be wrong about that. Right, way wrong. The Supreme Court uh, slapped him down quickly, which is great. But what it does mean is he's willing to do what he can uh, and get away with it until he uh, is expressly, um, you know, barred by the U.S. Supreme Court from doing that. Which is a disturbing notion because the Supreme Court can only take so many cases, and I, and he obviously knows that. So he knows he can get away with something until a court tells him otherwise. So so we've seen this in other countries. Obviously, I mean, we have uh, you know South Africa has a major issue that's been going on for years as to whether um, people will lose their ownership of property um, and, and it will go back either to the state or to the indigenous people. So the question is, is that is that something that you see or is this, um, is this really like a short-term thing and you think that, um, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be done, you know, once the so-called pandemic is over, which, I mean, the pandemic is so-called over is what I mean, I'm not saying it's not a pandemic, but um, it could, I mean, COVID's going to be with us forever. So is this something that continues forever? Or do you think this is something that is, that really is short lived? And then um, uh, we go back to, uh, you know, what real property rights, or is it going to be limited to those states that uh, uh, enforce property rights like Texas and Arizona and, and a lot of the, the Western and Southern states? What, what do you think is going to happen in the future? And I'm asking for a crystal ball, but I'm sure interested in what you think is, might happen. I think it's going to be hard to return to the status quo that existed before um, for a few reasons. One, I think that uh, governors have learned what they can get away with, and they've learned that they can get away with quite a lot, um, and the federal government's learned it can get away with quite a lot. Now, there are some limits to that, like thankfully the U.S. Supreme Court has, has uh, in a lot of ways, been pretty good on this, taking emergency applications that they typically would probably deny. Um, but I think by and large, uh, you know, state governments have gotten this imprimatur from courts that, hey, we're going to, uh, we're, we're not going to question your exercise of, of uh, government power in a way that I don't think we've seen previously. And I think it's, this will be cited as precedent in the future for governors who want to um, extend their power and exercise executive power that the legislature just has not given them. So I think that's ominous for property rights. I will say some states have said, you know, we need to shore up um, the, the exercise of emergency power. And and so some states have responded, I think, in a positive way. But uh, it's going to be hard to return to the normal once governors have seen what they can get away with. Interesting. So there are states, of course, who've gone the other direction, 
right? And the so-called red states versus the blue states. But there are states that definitely have gone to, like Texas and, and, and some of these states that have shored up property rights. Um, do you think that, that combined with the notion that it's easy to live away from your employer, right, which we've learned over the last year and a half, that you'll see more and more of businesses and people moving to those states because that's where, that's where the housing will be. I definitely think that's already happening. I mean, I live in, in Utah and uh, in Utah and other Rocky Mountain states and of course in the Sunbelt states, um, you know, the, the, the flight from the um, coast to, has been ongoing for a long time, but I think it's increased rapidly. I mean, the housing prices in Utah just over the course of the pandemic have skyrocketed as people have said, you know what, we can't deal with this kind of, a lot of it is uncertainty, right? They no longer know whether they're the rights they've relied on uh, for business and for uh, just for retirement, for whatever it might be, are no longer reliable. They just, and I think that that creates an atmosphere of fear that people want to avoid. So, so it actually creates an opportunity for those states and an opportunity in those states, it sounds like, because it sounds like there's going to be more and more need for housing in those states that allow uh, property rights and, and, and support property ownership. Is, would, I mean, is that something that you think we'll see continuing on as this continues? I think so. And at the same time, I'm worried because I, I think we've seen that sometimes um, people fleeing the coasts bring their politics with them. Right? Mm -hmm. so it, it often changes the political dynamics of the, of the region. And unfortunately, they like to um, enact a lot of the same faulty programs that resulted in the problems that they were trying to flee. Interesting. So, um... Just give us a couple of things. What what can a, you know, outside of, you know, looking for uh, ways to evict somebody besides um, non-payment of rent, what can uh, landlords do right now? What should real estate, um, particularly, uh, you know, um, residential real estate investors be doing right now? What are, what are a few takeaways, do you think? Well, I have a, a number of landlords I've spoken with have just approached their tenants and said, you know what, I will forgive the bulk of the rent or whatever if you just move out. Um, that's an unfortunate concession to have to make because sometimes we're talking about, uh, frankly, a year or more of, of, uh, of back rent. But it, I think some landlords are starting to say that's a better deal than just mm -hmm. continue to suffer around it. So that's one option. I mean, a lot, a lot of times these tenants are probably willing to be more reasonable than the governments that have given them this uh, this right to just simply live on the property. And as you mentioned before, this isn't to say that the tenants are acting in bad faith. Some of them, unfortunately, are. It creates a perverse incentive when they're told they don't have any consequences. You know, there are people who will just always take advantage of that. A lot of these tenants, though, just, uh, I mean, they're, they've fallen on hard times like landlords and many other people have. And, they, and they're willing to work with their landlords on things like that. And it's a better deal for them to move out if the, a lot of that rent will be forgiven. So that's one option that I think uh, a lot of landlords at this point are seeing as the better way to go. Do you think landlords will, um, in some cases, actually pay their tenant to move out? In other words, uh, not only will we forgive what you've done, but we'll pay you uh, perhaps first and last month's rent of you know, wherever you go. So we'll give you $5,000 to leave. I, I have seen that exact thing happen. And, and you know, it's, it's amazing that that's, where landlords are at, but it, but you know it, it, if it if it's a term that gets them the right to possess their property, I think it's often worth paying the price. Cut, cut your losses. That's right. It, it, especially in a hot market, right? I mean, we we we're seeing um, a bed and breakfasts that are being turned into homes, and we're you know I could see duplexes easily being turned into homes, single family homes. Um, as as we see that happen, that may be a legitimate option, and maybe a, a much a very inexpensive option. Um, frankly. Um, besides uh, getting their tenants out, working with them, anything else? Is, are the, do they have any legal rights? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm an attorney, so um, I'm the hammer that always sees the nails. <laughs> Litigation is, oh, is, you know, is always an option, and I'm hopeful that some of these cases will start winning. Um, in the meantime, though, I, I think there's unfortunately very little that can be done. Again, looking for other um, lease violations is one way to do this. Um, you know, a lot of 
a lot of these landlords are good faith people who want to work with their tenants, mm -hmm. who want to keep their tenants housed. And so um, just restoring them to the right to actually negotiate with those tenants is all that they need. So to the extent that um, mediation is available, some, uh, some, some cities and states have started to strengthen or provide mediation services that could be helpful um, to work out that kind of bargain that they're otherwise unable to get. Okay, well, um, not not a pleasant situation. Uh, you know, we're here because we are, and uh, but really appreciate Ethan you coming on and giving us some options and what you see um, for the future. Do you think it spells um, less investment in the U.S. Because of course, internationally, um, typ uh, typically the U.S. has been seen as a safe haven, uh, particularly U.S. real estate. Do you think it will continue to be seen as a safe haven um, investment from from uh, overseas, or do you think that's starting to change as well? I've wondered that, and I, I and I personally just—it's uh, not my area of expertise, but I haven't seen a change. Um, but I have wondered. I mean, I so I, I watch carefully in the city of Seattle, which where I, I've done a lot of work, and it does. And there was a lot of foreign. Yes, investment. I understand you're well known in the city of Seattle. I am well known there, <laughs> in, in in both a good and bad way. Um, and, and there has been a lot of especially Asian investment in real estate there. Uh, I would not be surprised if that does change. It's such, a, it's in, just in general for business in general, it's such an unfriendly and hostile regulatory environment. But especially over the last year and a half, I think, how could investors not see that, you know, for the last year and a half, they, if they had invested, they would be getting no return whatsoever in a lot of property and just say that's not worth it. Um, well, thank you, uh, Ethan Blevins. Uh, how would somebody uh, reach you or get more information about um, Pacific Legal Foundation? So the easiest way is our website, pacificlegal.org. All our cases, all our work is on there, pretty easy to access. And there's an inquiry um, spot where if people are uh, interested in, in uh, presenting an issue to us, that can be done. My email is at is eblevins at pacificlegal.org. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. And thanks, everybody, for uh, watching and listening. Um, you know, the more we understand about what's going on, what is possible, and not just, you know, we think we've got this rule of law in the country. And, you know, when a president ignores the rule of law, when governors uh, seemingly ignore the rule of law, what do we do? And we still have to deal with it. So we, we have to make our decisions. We have to do it based on our education. When we get educated, we're always going to make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.